we're done to let you present. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes. Um, it's a little bit low on the volume, but... Um... Okay, how about now? Yeah, I think it works, though. Okay, great. Well, thank you uh, for the introduction, and uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, as you um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, um, my name is John Keniston. I'm a senior faculty specialist here at the University of Maryland Department of Geographical Sciences um, here in College Park, Maryland. Um, and my primary role is as a uh, developer and programmer for the uh, supporting the NASA Harvest Consortium. Uh, so in my talk today, I'll be discussing our newly redesigned uh, global agriculture monitoring system um, and how it provides open earth observation data and other tools to assist in agricultural monitoring and analysis of global food security. Um, however, I wanted to start uh, my talk today just by discussing a little bit about uh, NASA Harvest and our consortium here. Um, so uh, what is NASA Harvest? Uh, simply put, it's uh, NASA's food security and agriculture program. Um, and as the uh, sort of mission statement says there, the, uh, the mission is to promote the use of Earth observations uh, for agriculture and food security, um, sort of in a nutshell. Um, but a, a unique aspect of this consortium is that while it's um, a NASA Applied Sciences program, it's also led by research, it's hosted and led by researchers here at University of Maryland. Um, so that sort of allows us to um, um, create this multidisciplinary consortium uh, where we can collaborate with uh, other scientists and agricultural stakeholders uh, throughout the US and throughout uh, the world. Um, so why do we need a program like Harvest? Um, uh, so obviously one of the growing challenges uh, throughout the world and, you know, in the coming years is food security. Uh, and as um, we know in um, the geospatial world or the earth observations world that uh, earth observation technology and earth observation capabilities are continuing to grow. Uh, the technology is continuing to, to get better. So the hope is that combining um, this earth observation information with an overall understanding of the food system uh, can help better address food security in um, some of the approaches that are listed here. So informing policy analysis and informing policy decisions, um, <clears throat> providing early warning information is a huge, um, can provide a huge impact uh, to you know, help bolster food security. Um, uh, and just continued monitoring and uh, evaluation of interventions to address food security. Uh, and then the next question is, you know, what's the role of geospatial in NASA Harvest? Uh, and obviously, Earth observation data is inherently spatial. Um, and, you know, a core part of the NASA Harvest program is actually disseminating this Earth observation data. So visualizing it, distributing it, and um, providing uh, additional analysis to analysts or other stakeholders. So this is where um, myself and the rest of the development team at Harvest uh, comes in, uh, led by Dr. Michael Humber uh, here at Maryland. Um, so we're working on a few projects. One of the projects we're currently in de developing now is what we're calling the Harvest Portal, which will be our main platform for disseminating um, geospatial data and other data related to agriculture. Um, but another one of those projects is this uh, GLAM system, which I'll be mostly talking about today. Um, so now that we've gone over NASA Harvest, what, what is GLAM? Uh, so GLAM stands for the Global Agriculture Monitoring System. And uh, it's a web-based platform designed to enable near real-time monitoring of global croplands, primarily using NASA's uh, MODIS satellite data, moderate re resolution uh, imaging spectrometer. Uh, 
And um, this is a project that's been in operation for over a decade now. Um, but over the last year or so, we've been able to redesign the system to be faster, more flexible, uh, and to bring in additional data sets uh, for more, you know, more detailed analysis. Um, and as I should point out, this newly redesigned system was developed using open source geospatial software and offers free and open earth observations data for you know, focused on agriculture monitoring. So as I mentioned, um, this uh, system has uh, been in place for over a decade. It began as a um, as the Global Agriculture Monitoring Project, and it was a joint initiative uh, with NASA, USDA, uh, University of Maryland, and South Dakota State University. Um, and it was primarily uh, created to support the USDA's um, Foreign Agriculture Service. Um, uh, yeah, primarily using this MODIS satellite data. And the goal was to develop a system which could be used by specialists there at USDA, but also non-specialists who were focused on agriculture monitoring and food security. Um, and so on this slide here, I've got a few screenshots of the original system. Um, and it essentially fun functioned as an NDVI database. Um, so uh, the system was able to process these MODIS and DVI products, uh, visualize them, provide some basic visualizations. And then on top of that, uh, provide some basic time series uh, analysis charting tools. Um, and here's another screenshot here just to give you an idea of the original system. So it provides some basic visualization with um, that sort of static image there. Uh, showing NDVI, and the system was divided into uh, regions uh, throughout the globe. And then here's another in-depth screenshot of the um, time series NDVI charting tools. So uh, you may be asking why NDVI and, and you know what is that what is NDVI's role in agriculture monitoring? And this may be a repeat for uh, some of you in the audience today, but Essentially, NDVI, normalized difference vegetation indice, uh, correlates well with vegetative health. Um, you know, it's essentially a measure of uh, greenness. Um, so uh, not only can it help provide uh, information about overall vegetative health, but it also gives us an idea of the um, sort of the seasonality in the growing period of crops uh, so we can look at the you know rate of green up and um you know as the harvest comes we can you know can see how the crop we can monitor the crop throughout its uh its its life cycle and uh season and uh this is an example uh a, re a real world use case of the original glam system and how it was used in the pet in the past uh just one example a few examples of how it was used in the past to monitor crops, um, in this case in Sinaloa, Mexico. Um, so you can see this um, NDVI time series data um, get, would give us an idea um, through a drought or through a frost kill of you know the health of the vegetation uh, through these different um, um, environmental uh, phenomenon. So um, the original GLAM system um, functions really well, and it had a wide user base, and it was very successful. So, you, you know, the, one of the questions is why move on to a new system, and you know, why upgrade upgrade it? Um, and while the system does function well, there were some limitations, um, and one of those limitations was the large data volume, um, because of the way the original system was made. Uh, to create the NDVI visualizations, uh, each observation, um, each uh, <clears throat> each combination of NDVI observations needed to be stored and cached. Um, so that you know led to this you know exponentially large data volume over 300 terabytes of disk space. Um, and as I mentioned, it was also divided into a regional system, um, and some users were interested in having a global system where you could sort of pan around the world and look at different areas, um, you know, all on one page. Um, 
this uh, current the original implementation also required um, a huge investment in on-premises hardware and infrastructure, um, and there sometimes were long retrieval times for some some data. So um, one of the questions that came up was if NASA moves its data to the cloud, how can uh, we leverage cloud infrastructure to reduce costs and hopefully improve performance? Uh, so myself and uh, Dr. Humber and the others at NASA Harvest were tasked with creating a prototype of this GLAM, GLAM system first to sort of answer this question about the feasibility of um, you know, using our existing analysis tools and moving them to the cloud. Uh, and then the other aspect of it was, you know, hopefully improving this system and seeing if we could, you know, make it better. Um, so we were successfully able to develop this prototype um, and we developed it using serverless architecture. Um, in our case, we used Amazon Web Services, but, you know, we can achieve this serverless architecture on you know many cloud providers um, but essentially what it's comprised of is that we have a quote-unquote bucket just a, a storage space of our cloud optimized geotiffs our, our raster imagery for that um, ndvi and other data sets and then we have a postgres database to store information system information and other uh, time series data and then the actual API and the application and uh, tile server that is a it's essentially Python code um, that sits on what Amazon calls their Lambda functions, and that's this serverless microservice in the cloud that doesn't require the um, the big investment in hardware. Um, so by leveraging this serverless architecture. Um, and creating, you know, this application with open source geospatial software, we've been able to create an API that provides all this information on the fly, as opposed to storing this um, on the disk, you know, as I mentioned before with the old system, uh, you know, saving every uh, combination of, you know, of data. So we can, um, yeah, as I said, we have this tile server that can generate tiles on the fly. It can project the data on the fly, mask it, um, provide this um, image differencing for anomaly visualization. You can, you know, apply many different color tables to it. And um, importantly, you can pull data from these images on the fly as well. So, you know, moving to the serverless system, we've been able to you know, massively re reduce our storage requirements and um, save on costs as well. Um, and because of that, we were able to add new data sets to the system, like precipitation, soil moisture, and surface temperature, which, you know, helps enhance that agriculture monitoring for uh, the users of the, si of the system. Um, so as I mentioned, this API was created with open source uh, geospatial software, including GDAL, uh, as I mentioned, Postgres, and PostGIS on the back end uh, for the database. Uh, and then the API is actually created with Django and Django REST framework, which is a Python web framework. And then to for the tile server and other um, geospatial um, services that the API provides, um, we used uh, REST.io and other Python libraries. Um, and it was heavily inspired by uh, Terracotta, which is a similar Flask based, um, Flask is another Python web framework, um, a Flask based tile server. Um, and the, here are a few screenshots of this API. Um, and um, as you can see, and as I'll show you in screenshots um, later on, this um, this new system is much more modern um, It's it, than the older system. Um, you know, while that older system worked very well, it was it was sort of dated. Um, so it was nice to get an update for um, users who would like to uh, access this data programmatically. Um, and this is just an example uh, request of uh, time series data for a specific um, product. In this case, it's eight day NDVI composite. We're looking at Brazil um, and applying a, a maize crop mask and then, you know, just retrieving data from 2019 to present. Um, so you can see, you know, you can easily access this data programmatically now with this new API. And in addition to the API, we have a brand new front end 
web application, um, which is uh, great for our non-technical users to, to use to monitor agriculture and food security. Um, so a great effort was made to ensure that this new application matched the functionality of the original system since we did have a really good user base. Um, but we also wanted to provide some new features and provide a more modern web mapping experience. So we've been able to create these highly customizable charting tools um, and you can share these, your whatever analysis you create with these tools on social media, which is fun. Um, now you, you can also upload or draw your own geometry. So as opposed to using a pre-calculated um, administrative boundary, um, if you have a specific uh, field or area of interest, you can upload it to the site and then generate data from whichever product you're looking at. Um, and as I mentioned before, too, we've been able to add new products, uh, chirps precipitation, uh, Meritu temperature, um, soil water index from Copernicus, uh, and, and others. Uh, and here's a, a more detailed overview of which products we have in the system already. So we have multiple NDVI products from Modus uh, in near real time NDVI as well. Uh, we also have NDWI from Modus, chirps precipitation, as I mentioned, Meritu temperature, and we have um, that broken out into min, mean, and max temperature and soil water index. Uh, but we're also planning on adding new data sets in the future too. So um, VRS NDVI as the Modus uh, project um, nears the end of its life cycle. And then we're also planning on adding additional soy moisture, um, temperature, other data sets as well. Uh, so here are a few uh, screenshots of the imagery visualization of the application. Um, and you can see you can easily view NDVI anomaly or anomaly for the other products in five or 10 year increments. And you can see you can also mask this data for uh, different crops. I think in this case, I've got a soybean mask applied at that bottom left image. Um, so you can see it just filters out all the other data for you. Um, and then another key component of the application are these customizable charting tools. So you can create a time series uh, for a specific geographic region. And we've got these pre-calculated um, areas for uh, country level and then the sub-national level. Uh, but you can also, as I mentioned before, you can generate an analysis for um, a either drawing your own geometry or uploading a file like a GeoJSON or KML. And then you can also, um, in addition to time series, you can see the uh, a histogram of the distribution of uh, values over that geographic area too. Um, and in addition to just viewing this chart, you can download the data behind the chart uh, and you can share it. So it's, it's, it's much more flexible than it's uh, been in the past. And another key component of the system is that we have the ability to create these regional interfaces. So Harvest is partnered with organizations um, around the world to uh, create these custom sort of skins of this GLAM application. It's, it's, it's mostly the same, but it has just an extra little bit on top to specific to the country or region um, in question. Um, so as you can see here, here we've partnered with Canab in Brazil, uh, Inta here in Argentina, Inya in Chile, and um, uh, ICPAC for Eastern Africa. So we have some of these special regional interfaces where users provide special crop masks or geographic boundaries, um, you know, beyond the, the national and subnational ones that we have in the main system so that we can generate a time series analysis for those specific areas. Um, and if there's anyone in the audience today who might be interested in that, um, you know, that you've got a, a region or um, you've got specific crop masks that you'd like to pull data for, you know, please let us know. We'd be happy, happy to work with you. Um, and in addition to those features that I've gone over um, before, we're planning on adding even more features. So we'd like to, add um, the capability of uh, user accounts to the site. So you'll be able to save your analysis and more easily uh, share your analysis and your areas of interest. Um, we're planning on adding custom reports to the site. And then sort of the one last um, 
uh, capability of the old system that we're um, that we have yet to add is this imagery export and download. So that'll be coming soon as well. And then just a general continued updates and performance improvements. So um, Glim two, as we're calling it, um, it's already you know, been used. Um, and we've already had a lot of trainings on it with some of our partners. So for example, here in Argentina, even the Buenos Aires grain exchange, um, you know, has been used by their analysts and has been even been their analysis using the system has even been mentioned in some, some national papers. And then, um, as I mentioned before, Inta is one of the organizations that we've partnered with to create one of these custom interfaces. So they provided us with their um, mat crop masks specific to Argentina, and then some boundaries they wanted to look at. Um, and we were able to process that information for them and provide it in this um, into a specific interface. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to um, say thank you. Um, and if you'd like to know more about GLAM, you can visit uh, glam.nasaharvest.org. That's where the site is. Um, and you can also contact me personally if you have any other additional questions. Thank you so much, John, for the presentation. Uh, it's been very nice to, to learn about Gram and what you're doing there. We have a couple of questions coming already, um, and we have a few minutes for, for them. Um, how does Glam detect NDVI anomalies? Um, so what we do for the anomaly is we, um, we calculate the average or we calculate the mean and median NDVI over five and 10 year and increments. Um, and then what you can do in the system is you can select any date and see the, uh, the difference from that mean or median to whichever date you're looking at. So it's very dynamic and you can view the anomaly for um, any date in the system essentially. Um, so there's, no, I guess, there, yeah, there's no sort of um, detection of high or low anomalies. It's, um, you can create your own anomaly visualization. All right, and we have a second uh, question. Um, is it possible to do spectral analysis with MODIS bands uh, through GLAM uh, 2.0 API, uh, looking at other vegetative um, measures aside from NDVI? Oh, that's a great question. Um, at, Right now, uh, no, but um, but um, yeah, in the future, we're uh, hoping to provide more direct access to the raster imagery. Um, and in that case, you'd be able to um, you know perform that different analysis using um, using those the raw bands. Um, but right now, we basically have them saved as uh, uh, composites, uh, geotiffs, and uh, so, but that's a great question. Uh, we don't have any more questions right now, but I popped the banner that we prepared for you. And um, if anybody wants to put more questions, we still have a little bit of time. Uh, if not, you can um, contact John on the platform, uh, Fanulas, or um, if he agrees on the, on the following email, um, and ask more questions um, personally. <laughs> We're going to wait a few minutes more, uh, see if there are any other questions. Um, in the meantime, um, I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, um, pass to to uh, my colleague Olami Posi. Okay, we have another uh, question. Uh, what are your thoughts about using other sensors um, other than MODIS for NDVI? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, and I think I sort of quickly went by in the presentation. But uh, we are planning on adding VIRS uh, NDVI um, pretty. Quickly. Quickly, um, in the near future. Um, so I think we're gonna, as far as NDVI is concerned, we're gonna begin with that. But I think uh, it's an an open question because now with the the way this new system is designed, it's very easy to add new data sets. So we're sort of at the point um, in this 
with this project where we're we're trying starting to evaluate other data sets and you know which data sets we'd actually like to include in the system um but yeah definitely beers there are no more other questions but i i might have a question for you uh sure. if it's possible uh if um it's on par for the resolution so if you can add other sensors that have low resolution or come from private uh, companies that might want to share so certain data sets yeah it's so it is um independent of resolution so for example the um the modus data sets we have in there are at 250 meter resolution and then um the other precipitation uh temperature data sets are much coarser so um yeah it's 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 um we can it's flexible and um we have experimented with other for example with some, some planet data um and some other you know very high resolution data in the system and it works you know, it works just as well so um yeah, I guess yeah, we're still looking at what which uh, imagery to include and but it will be expanding in the future for sure. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question. Will the data be available through COGs uh, directly uh, from S3? So the yes to the imagery will be available directly. I, I'm not sure if we're going to provide it directly from the S3 bucket. Um, we we're still working out that imagery export function of the site. Um, so whether that's delivered through here through the University of Maryland or directly from S3, that's still a, a question. But we will for sure be able to deliver um, both the entire um, uh, COG or a subset of that. So we'll have a tool where you'd be able to draw your own geometry or upload it and then export a subset uh of that imagery all right um thank you so much john um we'll thank be you. waiting for um more questions if you have them. we still have about one minute to um to conclude this q a session if not uh we're gonna try to proceed to our next speaker um Thank you. I think it's safe to conclude this uh, Q&A. If you have any more questions, uh, just uh, ask John directly. Uh, he's going to be on the platform, I guess, um, So um, and also responsive on his email, probably. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for yeah. your presentation, John, and thank have you. a nice hospital G. Thanks.